I'm really happy to be a part. Um, so I'm Erin, and today I wanted to share with you a little bit about how we do testing at Zymergen and how it compares and contrasts with what you might have done uh, in your own jobs in terms of A-B testing. <laughs> I, 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 didn't, I wasn't addicted to Pokemon Go until after I had already made this talk. But yeah. <laughs> so I'm a data scientist at Zymergen. Uh, but my journey actually starts, my journey to that job, starts uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, where I was an economics student um, at Case Western Reserve woo! in my junior year. Woo! <laughs> All right? Wait, that wasn't Gary. Woo, woo, woo. Hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so my junior year, I got an internship at the National Institutes of Health, and I worked in the Division of Computational Biosciences with this mathematician named James Malley. And this was really my first introduction the only introduction, my introduction to machine learning um, and applying statistics to biological questions. And I really, really loved what I was working on there. And so uh, that inspired me to continue uh, my education at the University of Michigan, where I did my master's in biostatistics and then my PhD in bioinformatics. And so after spending the better part of a decade working on questions in computational metabolism, I did the natural thing of um, moving to Seattle to work in fashion retail technology. Um, and started out in that industry at Nordstrom, the Nordstrom Data Lab, where I worked primarily on building product recommendations for Nordstrom.com. Spent some time at AWS working on a product called S3. Uh, and then finally, at, near the end of last year, I had this opportunity to join this amazing company uh, in the Bay Area called Zymergen. So I'm actually remote in Seattle. So Zymergen is really a platform for the rapid improvement of microbial strains through genetic engineering. And so you may be wondering, well, oh, what is genetic engineering? And if you are wondering that, I highly encourage you to just go ahead and uh, Google search that because you're gonna get a, a, some, a lot of insight into the explosion of tools we have available, including the syringe. <laughs> Scissors, a scalpel, those little screwdrivers you use to adjust your glasses, and obviously the wrench we have. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of really fascinating imagery that if you, if you ever do a talk, for example, uh, it's on synthetic biology that you can uh, use for cheap gags. And of course, we'll get a lot of information about the applications of genetic engineering, like creating horrifying clones of weird robo baby and injecting genetic material directly into our fruits and vegetables via a syringe. Uh, no wonder people are scared of GMOs. Uh, but really guys, so this less funny diagram is a, is a pretty reasonable description of what we do at Zymergen, kind of end to end. So we work with customers who use uh, industrial fermentation to make materials and molecules. And so they'll come to us with a microbe that they want to improve or they want to engineer uh, to be better at what it does. So that's that could either be make more of the thing with less inputs or just make more of the thing. And so in this particular example, we're actually using microbes to make uh, insulin. So the process looks something like this. You take a bug, for this application it's going to be something like yeast or E. coli most likely, and then you take this little <coughs> circular piece of DNA called a plasmid, you pop that thing open and you insert the gene that you want to express inside this bug. In this case, we're interested in the uh, human insulin gene. You stick that thing in there. Once it's in there, when those cells proliferate, that's going to include that new plasma, that new DNA that we've introduced. And as part of its normal, well, once we stick these things in tanks uh, with a bunch of food, as part of their normal life cycle and part of their metabolism, they're going to start excreting insulin into the environment around them. And then we can take that environment, we can purify it, and suddenly we have insulin. So this is kind of what North, uh, North, what Zymer did. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're too close to like this out here. This is very, very strange. Uh, this, is, this is what Zymer did does, kind of end-to-end in-house. But we spend a lot of time working in these first one to four steps. And there's actually a lot of complexity that's not really being represented in this really simple diagram here. And, and that's really about how do you know what to put in there? So this is a pretty simple example where we knew what we wanted to make and somehow we magically knew which gene in our genome encodes that protein that we're interested in making. But this is a pretty unique example and most of the time we're not actually interested in introducing a completely new functionality into the microbes. We're interested in tweaking existing functionality. So often we're interested in making the molecules that 
these microbes would make naturally anyway, but we just really want to uh, engineer them to make a lot more of it than, than they would ever make in nature for our own nefarious purposes. So what do we do in this case if we don't know what to do to the genome? So if you were in an academic environment, for example, you might reduce the system to its constituent parts and then experiment on each part one at a time until you finally arrive on some kind of causal mechanism. And then, of course, at the end of all of that, you're going to hopefully graduate or uh, publish a paper or uh, ideally both. And that's great. I'm being kind of snarky here, not because this doesn't work. Of course, this works. This is just reduction to science. The problem is that this can be really, really slow, especially when you think about how big genomes are. And so at Zymergen, we, we take a kind of a different approach. We actually have a platform and we have the ability to instead just try thousands of things. So ask thousands of questions in parallel and just see what works. Often we're not actually interested in the causal mechanisms that create more of the product we want. We just want something that works. And we do that with uh, high-throughput screening. So high-throughput screening is really just a process for evaluating many simultaneous hypotheses or asking uh, about strains, comparing many strains in parallel. And so here is a simplification of what this looks like for us. So we start with a tier one screen. So we're going to have a bunch of strains that we've engineered. We've tweaked their genomes uh, in different ways. We're going to screen and look for hits. So we're going to look for things that have uh, the characteristics we're interested in. Uh, and, and at this step, we're really interested in minimizing false negatives. So the, at this point, it's very costly for us to miss opportunities to pursue a promising strain. So we're much more willing to accept a high level of false positives here because we're going to do another round of screening and then we're going to do another round of screening. In the second screen, our, our priorities change a little bit. So now we're interested in minimizing false positives. So we're going to do kind of the same thing again. Uh, we're going to ask the same question, but with now kind of things that have made it into the, have been promoted into the other uh, uh, round of screening. And then finally, the thing that we are interested in that our customers are interested in is how does it perform in a fermentation tank? Because this is how they're going to be applying it. They don't actually care how it performs in these dense plates, right? They care about how it performs here. And so finally, our last step of validation is tank performance. And so what I'm going to talk about today is a simulation environment that myself and a colleague uh, at Zymergen made to help us actually put numbers on these, on these kind of high-level goals and decide what values we need, what basically how many replicates do we need to run of each strain so that we can make sure that we're hitting these goals at each step of our screen. If you guys wouldn't mind uh, waiting until the end for questions, I just want to make sure we finish, unless, it's, unless something doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so high throughput screening, uh, in my mind, poses kind of two unique challenges that, I, challenges that I think are a little bit distinct from those that you might face uh, in an A-B testing uh, situation, and particularly if that's A-B testing on, in like a, a web uh, context. The first is low sample size, and this is something that A-B testers typically don't experience at all. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk about, uh, people don't think a lot about because they kind of, in a sense, don't need to. Uh, and the second is high variance. So the first thing, small sample size, is actually largely by design. So kind of the premise of all screening, uh, including ours, is that almost virtually everything that we're going to try is not going to work. So most things are going to be neutral or they're going to be deleterious. So we're actually going to hurt the bug and it's going to die or it's going to perform worse. Um, and so why would we waste a bunch of resources up front on a bunch of strains that are just gambles and are likely going to not actually get us closer to our goal? So this is, this is, not a, this is actually kind of a feature of what we're doing. And the second thing is high variance. So part of the reason that we're able to test so many things in parallel is that we rely heavily on robotic automation to do a lot of our experimentation or specifically to move our samples around as they progress through these fairly complicated protocols. And so each one of those steps through these processes is uh, an opportunity to inject uh, unwanted bias or process-related variability into the measurement values that we observe. Ultimately, we only want to know if a strain is better than another strain, but there's a lot of sources of variation that we would like to be able to control either through process improvement or control through analytical measures. And this is just an example of what like one of our teeth can decks kind of looks like picking up this. So this little arm thing picks up plates and moves them around various places. It's actually pretty 
hypnotic and terrifying. Um, so why why are these two features uh, annoying? Well, if you're a statistician, they're kind of annoying because all of like your really lazy kind of like oh that's an easy thing to do. All of those tools are going to break down in this situation. So if you think about just like the vanilla t test, it makes pretty strong distributional assumptions about its inputs. In particular, it assumes that the samples you're comparing are normally distributed, and in its most basic uh, variation, it assumes that the variance of those two of those two samples are also equal. And so we can't assume that at all. And then, you know, you, you might say, like, wave your hands as we like to do, and say, well, if your sample's big enough, you can assume normality. Well, we know that our sample's not big enough, right? We, by design, we're keeping our sample and our resolution small so that we can ask a lot of questions, but we're not getting a lot of information about any individual question. So that's out. So all of this is really just to say that we need to be especially thoughtful in how we design our tests and how we design our experiments because if we mess up the design of something for a week, that's not like, oh, shucks, it's the wrong color button for a week and I just rerun my test. It's, oh man, we use a lot of pipette tips to do that. And that was actually pretty expensive. Oops. <laughs> So, and, and also like if we mess up one week, we're actually messing up thousands of experiments, not, not just one. Uh, so it, it means that we need to do a lot more upfront work uh, kind of to get this right. So these next couple of slides, if you have a stats background or uh, took a stats class recently, this is gonna be a very well-worn territory, but I just wanted to throw this in here to motivate the question that we're actually trying to answer and uh, yeah, think about it the same way. So basically the premise of the discipline of statistics is that the processes that we seek to understand and observe through experimentation and taking measurements follow some kind of unknown uh, and real distribution, in fact, unknowable distribution that we're interested in making inferences about. So in this particular context, I'm omniscient. And so I have these two distributions that are like these platonic ideals uh, but I happen to know that uh, this strain in gray, this mutant strain, is actually 15% better in terms of the mean. Its mean is 15% higher than this reference strain. And again, so this is this is a vast oversimplification of what our data actually look like. So these were simulated from the normal distribution. We know our data is not normal. So like this problem actually becomes a lot worse with what our data actually look like. So when we take measurements, what we're actually doing is getting little bits of information about what these true unknowable distributions look like, and then we try to use that information to make inferences about the characteristics of these distributions, and typically that's like inferences about the means of those distributions and whether those are different. The problem is that our ability to actually make good inferences about the, the nature of these distributions is really dependent on our resolution and how many samples uh, or measurements we took in our experiment. And so in this little example that I've rigged, say we only took three replicates or we only took three measurements from each of these, we might actually end up at the wrong conclusion. So we have two from each that are pretty well representative of what the means are, but then we get kind of unlucky for whatever reason. From the reference strain, we happen to observe a measurement value that's kind of high relative to its mean. And for our mutant strain, we happen to observe a measurement that's kind of low relative to its mean. And we don't know that because we're not actually omniscient when we do this experiment. All we see are these measurements. So then we maybe compute the mean, we maybe do a t-test. Either way, we're going to kind of we're going to arrive at the wrong inference. Of course, we don't know it's wrong again when we're doing the experimentation, but this thing is going to slip by us. This is a strain that had a 15% increase in the mean that we're going to miss. And it's really just a function of our resolution and our ability to detect changes when they actually are there. And so our question, the question that we are, <laughs> that we really want to know the answer to is how many measurements, how many of these replicates do we need to have before we can feel confident that we have taken enough to actually make correct or at least as good as we can inferences about the nature of these distributions and about whether that strain is actually an improved strain. And that depends on a lot of things, <laughs> but it depends on two big things. Uh, one of which is the expected effect size. So how big, how big of a change do you expect to see after you've done your intervention, after you've done whatever your genetic engineering is? And so you can see if I have, if I'm expecting a 5% difference in the means, for example, these distributions are almost completely on top of each other. It's gonna be very hard for me to detect 
a difference in means that's only 5%. Whereas if I have a 50% effect size, so if I have a 50% difference in the means, I can probably observe this with relatively few replicates compared to this one. That problem is made worse, of course, by variability, or it's made more complicated. So I might have only a 5% difference in the means, but if the variance of each of these is quite small, I'm still going to get pretty good. I'll still probably be able to, to make to come to the right conclusion with fairly few replicates. But if I have a 50% difference in the means, but one or both of these distributions is highly variable, I'm going to need to observe a lot more from this distribution before I can really come, before I can expect to come to the right conclusion. Luckily for us, there is a, you, you might have been waiting for this punchline after all this build up, there's a framework for thinking about this, these problems and it's called power analysis which is a, a method for estimating the sample size that's required to detect changes at assumed levels. So conceptually what we're actually going to do is start at the end of the, the end of the data collection then the end of the analysis and solve for the number of replicates that we would need or the number, the sample size that we would need, I keep saying replicates because that's what it is in our case, the sample size you would need in order to get the results that you want. And so you're kind of working backwards. And so power is just the probability of detecting a difference when a difference is present. Or so in uh, hypothesis testing speak, your power is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis of equal means when the null hypothesis is wrong. So when it is wrong, you want to be able to tell that it's wrong. Uh, and so we're doing this, we're, we're computing this power uh, empirically through simulation. So if you've ever done work with this stuff before, you might have solved for these things analytically. And in a lot of cases, you can solve analytically for power. We're going to do a couple little uh, variants that make that hard to do. So we're going to simulate, plus that's more fun. So power, power is a fixed parameter. So kind of how like with a p-value, you set, the, you set the, the value and then you do your experiment and then you don't change that threshold uh, after you've seen the experimental results. Power is kind of the same way. So ideally you do all of this before you do any experiments and then you don't change your thresholds in response to your experimental results. And similar to how p-values have this arbitrary industry cutoff of 0.05, power is similar where there's an arbitrary industry cutoff of about 0.8. Um, and so that really just means if we ran the same experiment uh, 100 times, 80 of those times we could expect to reject the null hypothesis, or 80% of the time we could expect to detect differences when differences are present. That also means that 20% of the time we can't, but we're cool with that. So that's power. So here's our study design. We are interested in looking at a couple different things. First, we are interested in comparing two different methods of detection. So your vanilla t-test and a sun rank test, which I'll talk about um, in a second. Uh, and then we are also interested in understanding how the performance of these two tests is modified by the presence or absence of contamination. So we are a microbiology company, and microbiology contaminates stuff. It's just the, kind of the way it is. Um, and so that's a problem that we face quite a bit. Another problem that we face quite a bit is that we use robots heavily for all of this stuff, and robots are great, but they mess up sometimes too. Pipette tips get stuck. Uh, stuff, an arm will put things down in the wrong spot and splash things everywhere. So there are a lot of sources of basically outliers or extreme uh, observations in our data um, that we're just calling contamination here. So for our purposes, contamination just means basically you've randomly lost a piece of uh, your measurement values. So without boring you too much, I mean, I'm bored just thinking about this as well. Uh, with the, the nature of these tests, we're interested in looking and comparing the performance of these two tests because basically the t-test makes strong assumptions that we think probably don't hold for our data and the sum rate test doesn't. So the t-test, as I mentioned before, is parametric, so it assumes distributional properties of its inputs. We have a lot of reason to think that we are not meeting that assumption. Uh, it's also sensitive to extreme values, and we have tons of reasons to know, to we know, that we have a lot of extreme values in our data. The sum rate test is also looking for differences, or looking for increases in our case, so we're, all, we're doing one-sided tests only. We only care about improvements, not worse strains. But the sum rank is an order statistic, so it is non-parametric. It doesn't make any assumptions about the uh, distribution of the data that you're comparing, and it's also less sensitive to extreme values. So we're, we have some reason to, 
reasons to think that maybe this test is going to perform better for the type of data that we generate at Zymergen. So here's what our simulation workflow looks like. So the first thing we're going to do is initialize a bunch of strings. So basically, we are going to use this to generate uh, hypothetical data that does reflect the kind of data we typically work with. So we're going to use the mean and standard deviation to generate op observations on our strings. And then we're going to initialize a campaign. And so the, a campaign for us is just basically the set of simulation parameters that were involved in any particular run. And so that's uh, that takes the strings as input, so the base strain that's your reference that you're comparing against, that's the one you want to beat. And then your mutants, your values of n, so what range of replication do you want to explore, your contamination rate, and then the test. And that test could be, that test for us is either a t-test or some rank, but you could think of that more generally as that could be just a rule, for example, of I'm going to promote everything that's two standard deviations away from the mean. That could be what your unit of detection is. Um, for us, it's going to be a p-value associated with the hypothesis test. So then we take all that, we come into the simulation part, we simulate data, so we have a string class and it has a method called get observations. It takes the number of replicates as an argument and then it throws back to you uh, sample data from the distributions that you initialized it with. And so those are your experiment values that, you, that we're simulating here. And then we're going to test for the differences uh, between those two uh, simulated data sets. And so, and then we're going to record the test results and we're going to do that 5,000 times. And so what we're trying to simulate here is doing the exact same comparison between the two same strains um, 5,000 times. And then our power uh, is just the number of times that we were able to detect that difference, so the number of times we were able to reject the null hypothesis, divided by the total number of times we ran the experiment. And then there's kind of a step that's not included here, which is to ask the question, did I meet my power threshold of 0.8 for this particular configuration uh, of the strains? And so I mentioned at the start that we're initializing strains with a mean and a standard deviation. And those values don't come from space. Uh, these values didn't come from space. This is all made up. But Zymergen's been around for about two and a half years. I've been around for nine months of that. So we had a lot of experimental data to, to work with when we built the simulator. So we're using past experiments to inform the parameters that we're exploring in the simulation. Just so you know, it's not completely, completely made up. I'm going to say that. You guys don't care about code, right? Um, <laughs> so here's the, here's the results. So these are the t-tests with no contamination. And you've got the number of replicates along the top here. That's kind of hard to see. So let's focus in on them. So here's the results with three replicates, and here's the results with ten replicates. And what are we looking at here? So on the x-axis, what we're looking at is that change in effect size. So how different is the mutant strain from the reference that you're comparing it against? So when you're here at this vertical line, the means are exactly the same. So the strains perform the same. As you move towards 100%, the uh, mutant strain is moving towards being better and better than the reference strain, up to 100% better than the reference strain. Similar thing going on on the y-axis, except now we're exploring a variance of the mutant strain. So underneath this uh, zero horizontal line, is the region, the parameter space, where the mutant strain is less variable than the reference it's being compared against. And above that line is the parameter space where the mutant strain is more variable than the reference it's being compared against. And so this allows us to kind of explore both the effect size and the variability of the uh, mutant, uh, mutant observations in terms of power. And so the last thing you didn't know is what are the colors. So the, the gray area is the parameter the parameter space where our power threshold was met, and the black region is the parameter space where our power threshold was not met. I think that's all you need to know. So how do you read this thing? So you could look at this and say, where, where does my threshold, where is the boundary where my threshold is beginning to be met? And then look here and say, oh, okay, well, if it's there, then that means a candidate strain, a mutant strain, would have to show about 40% improvement over its reference to be detectable with only three replicates. So that's a really big improvement. Uh, okay, so that's interesting to know. And also, furthermore, uh, that strain would similarly have to be less variable than the reference that's being compared against to be reliably detectable 
at that uh, point. If I run 10 replicates, on the other hand, a strain would only have to show about a 15% improvement compared to a reference to be reliably detectable or to, to meet our uh, power threshold. And that's actually pretty robust to a, a plausible range of variances to certainly everything that's less variable and then also up to like 25% uh, more variable than the reference. So as a biologist, uh, thinking about how to set up my screen, I could use this by saying, okay, well, I've done a couple screens, I have a good sense for kind of what to expect, and so I expect that my the strains I'm interested in will show 25% improvement, so my effect size is 25% greater than the reference. And so I might come back to this guy and say, okay, what number of replicates would I need in order to be able to reliably catch uh, changes of 25%? And if I look over at 10, I can see, well, that would definitely work, but I'm also like, that's probably too many because I'll be able to find things that are actually uh, smaller effect sizes. And so I'd be, I'd be uh, sacrificing capacity basically for this. And, that, and that's a real trade, that's a real trade off. I, don't, I feel like I didn't actually make that point, but that, that's really the trade off here is throughput or resolution. Uh, and so then maybe I'll look here and I'll say, oh, okay, well, I could probably reliably catch 20, maybe over here, but like it would also have to be a lot less variable. So to be safe, maybe I'll just pick six because I'll be able to catch that, or five even, uh, and for a plausible range of variances that I might expect to see in my uh, samples. Okay, so contamination, uh, not surprisingly, it makes it pretty hard to detect <laughs> changes when things are contaminated. So this is looking at a 5% contamination rate. And again, that's really just basically eliminating samples. So uh, eliminating them from the, uh, the test altogether. And so you can see where we were once able to uh, meet our power threshold or reliably detect uh, with 10 replicates effect sizes as small as 15%. In the presence of 5% contamination, now we're approaching something like 40%. So now if, if we have 5% contamination, even if we run 10 replicates, we won't be able to reliably uh, detect these differences or these changes in the strains until we are approaching really large effect sizes, something on the order of 40%. Is that, I'm just sorry to interrupt, yeah. is that under the assumption that you can actually detect the contamination? Do, uh, do, is, or, or do you just assume that some some of your, your sample, you're going to measure them, you're going to put them into your... And you're going to include that measurement, and you will never, you'll never know that there were contaminants. Yeah. So the question is, does that assume that you can detect contamination in order to do this? And contamination is really easy to detect. So like the, the result of it is that you have measurement values that are so, it's so extreme. So it's external contamination, not a, not contamination from your base, not not, not contamination mm -hmm. of your mutants, your base, and not contamination and vice versa. Yeah. So that's a great question. So. If it's contamination that basically results in you taking a strain with a genome that is not the strain you thought it was and sticking it in there, that's very hard to detect. So we'd probably never catch that. Something that happens very often is that it gets contaminated with bugs that are from the environment. And so we, those are easy to detect because they don't produce, they don't yield the thing we're looking for. And so we'll see a bunch of biomass, so there's tons of cells in there, but we don't see a corresponding, the titer, you know, the concentration. Uh, and so that's easy to detect, but the other thing where you have one of our strains, it's just not the one we think it is in the well, that's essentially impossible, like without sequencing and following up on things to detect. So yeah. That's not what you're modeling. That is not what we're modeling, yeah. <laughs> we're modeling like the unsubtle okay. type of contamination that we can actually awesome. yeah, think about. That's a great question. Yeah, microbes are terrible. <laughs> uh, and so, Finally, we were interested in the interaction of these things, of contamination and our unit of detection. So how did these tests perform uh, in the presence and absence of contamination? So these, so what we're looking at again is the, the increase in replicates, our replication strategy on the X, and then the average power. And so this is averaged over that parameter space that we were looking at in the previous figures. Um, and so these intertangled uh, lines at the top are the T-test and the sum rank test with no contamination at all. And so I was a little surprised to see this, actually, that they perform roughly equally well. I don't know if this is a function of the low sample size, but uh, I, I would expect that the t-test would perform better here. So I was surprised that these seem to perform pretty well and pretty equally um, in the presence of no contamination. 
On the other hand, this, so this bottom line is the t-test, and this is the power uh, under 5% contamination. And you can see that it's taking a huge performance hit in terms of power. Uh, and it also appears to show, uh, this is not very rigorous to say, but it appears to show uh, kind of fewer returns on replication. So like I, if I, I keep adding more replicates, but I'm not getting the same gains in power that I'm getting from the sum rate test, which you know is also hurt in terms of contamination, but not nearly so much as the t-test. And it also seems to recover better uh, with added replicates. And so the, really the thing that we learned from this is that something that I think we kind of knew anyway, which is that we generate data that is very hard to analyze with sort of our classical uh, tools. Um, and so we need to rely on um, robust and non-parametric methods when we're analyzing our data. I think we kind of knew that, but this is kind of a cool way to, to actually see that that is the case. Um, and so the results are that the presence of extreme values undermines our ability to detect uh, differences across the strains and across strain performances by effectively decreasing our sample size. So we've kind of simulated uh, an outlier detection algorithm and really just kind of deleted observations randomly. Um, but even, even so, we can make progress in the face of that by using uh, non-parametric and ideally robust uh, methods for detection that seem to perform roughly equally well as our uh, classical methods um, in ideal conditions, but perform a lot better than the t-test in the typical conditions that we actually experience. And so I wanted to bring, so there's a lot of stuff here, and I wanted to, to kind of end it with, um, so? <laughs> like, how are we using this right now? So like, this is all, like, for, for, from a power analysis perspective, there's nothing super new here, but the, the way that we are using this is by thinking about what the implications are across kind of our product uh, life cycle. And so this is a, uh, like a Zymergen classic figure, like every Zymergen talk must include uh, a slide like this. And what this is showing is sort of the, pr the productivity curve of our strains as a function of how long we're spending uh, working with them on our project. And so at the very beginning, when a customer comes to us with a bug, often that bug has already been engineered some, but it, suppose it wasn't, it's some kind of wild type bug, and they're like, make this thing better at making this molecule. At this stage, we are at this zero to milligram space, so we, that's the, the types of yields we can expect to get. But in terms of kind of the hits, what we can expect are things, we're going to be uh, exploiting kind of low-hanging fruit, exploiting things that are easy for us to do, we're gonna, we should expect some pretty big hit sizes here. So like 50% improvement, things on that scale, and the distribution of those hits we would expect to be kind of skewed towards the direction and still gonna be mostly neutral or null, or neutral or negative, but closer, we can expect more hits at this phase too, because we have a lot of really easy things, easy little tricks to exploit when we're first starting out. As we move into milligrams to kilograms, so bigs to kigs, level of the pro project, we've, ex we've exhausted all these little tricks that we like to do. And so now we have to think pretty hard about, you know, how are we gonna perturb the metabolic network so that we can get more out of this thing after we've already done all the easy stuff. So at this stage, we can expect that our hits are shrinking. So the effect size of those hits is shrinking. We can't expect a 100% improvement at this stage. And also that distribution of the hits is going to be skewed more towards neutral to negative things, where you can expect to see fewer of them also. And then finally, when we're at the kilograms to commodity phase, that's kind of, you know, these things have theoretical maximums, right? There's only so much you can get out of the system no matter what you do. And at this stage, we're reaching that. So we're getting very close to being able to not do anything else with the existing bug. And so as we get closer and closer to that theoretical max, our effect sizes are going to be shrinking and they're going to get really, really small. So then we're going to have to be able to have the resolution to detect things that are like 1% or 2% different than the mean versus down here where we can expect these huge hits that were like 50% or 100% different from the mean, between the means. And also now this distribution of hits is going to be highly skewed towards negative and neutral results because we've exhausted everything uh, in our tricks. And so now we're, we're getting very fine-tuned changes here to get that last mile out of these bugs. And so the point of this is really just to say that the experimental design that worked down here when we're looking for huge hits and we're looking for a number of them is not going to work up here when we're looking for tiny hits 
and we're looking for very few of them. And so we need to constantly kind of assess where we are in this uh, curve and, and rethink through this problem each time. And to, uh, to put sort of the, the operational implications on uh, our screening goals that we mentioned before, uh, again, in the, in the first tier, we are really concerned with minimizing false negatives. We don't want to miss an opportunity to observe a promising strain. And so that means that we're going to ask a lot of questions. We're going to have a lot of strains to test. Uh, we're going to have pretty low resolution or a low sample size for each of those, um, but also a low promotion threshold. So we're not going to have the bar too high. Maybe we'll have a 20% uh, false positive rate, and we're totally fine with that, because the next round of screening is, again, sort of inexpensive, and it's that's totally fine. We have a bunch of junk in there. When we move into, when we promote strains into tier two, now we're actually really interested in minimizing false positives because the next promotion into this tank or into the tank is extremely expensive uh, and resource constrained. So now we actually do want to eliminate that chat. So we are going to ask fewer hypotheses because we eliminated a bunch of uh, options from the top. Uh, we're going to have bigger samples here, bigger sample size at this stage, so we have better resolution and a higher promotion threshold. So where once our false positive rate might have been something like 20%, now it's going to be something like 5%. So we really want to eliminate things that don't pan out in Tier 2. And then finally, everything uh, ultimately goes to the tank, and that's where we get the actual indication of how these strains are going to perform uh, when they're put into production. And so here's what a hypothetical experimental design might look like, considering the life cycle of our projects, and then also the flow through our screening process. And so if you're down here at zero to milligrams, this is again that region where you can expect big hits, and a lot of them, you probably don't need that much resolution. You can probably get away with running, and these are all made up numbers, but <laughs> uh, you can probably get away with running something like four replicates of everything and having a, a low promotion threshold. And then when we approach tier two, we want to be more precise about the questions that we ask and answer. So we're going to run more replicates, and we're also going to ratchet down or up whatever way you think of it, we're going to make the, the threshold a lot harder. We're going to, make, we're going to raise the bar, essentially. Uh, and then the tank is the truth. That's where we get our actual, all of this is meant to be a proxy for how, the, how they perform here anyway, but we always validate this way. And then as we move through the production cycle and we're approaching the end of it, we're going to basically just keep adding resolution at each step and then adding resolution at each step through our tiers. So... I want to close by pointing out that we are hiring uh, both in Seattle and in the Bay Area. So if you want to do data science and microbiology and stats and bioinformatics and everything that we do, uh, NGS, whatever, come talk to me afterwards um, or email me or something. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Thank you. Nice talk. Thank you. Um, so when you did the simulation, and step one, you gave the mean and the variance, but are you making any distributional assumptions? Yeah, so she asked if I'm making distributional assumptions in the simulation when I generate those uh, observations. And yes, I'm making distributional assumptions. Uh, for, for what you saw there, uh, I think we assume normality. And so we know that that's not true. Um, and so... Yeah, and to, to actually use this, we can't just, we can't make that assumption. We have to assume distributions that are more uh, representative of what our actual distributions look like. Would that perhaps affect the performance of the sun rank over the t-test? Uh, lack, lack of performance. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, actually, in, in that case, I would expect well. the t-test should be better because the because assumptions the are normal. actually met. Yeah, because right. it is actually coming from normal normally distributed data. So, yeah. But yeah, I mean, that would definitely <laughs> affect it. How do you decide, like, which uh, organism to put a gene into? Does that have to do with, like, you, you showed the, the sort of mix to cakes curve. Uh -huh. And at the you talked about, like, sort of the theoretical maximum amount of oomph you could get out of the system by putting this in. Do you look to pick an organism based on how much you think you can improve the the output of these particular molecules or something like that? How much expression you can output? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, do you pick an organism that it makes sense for the molecule you're trying to make? So are there ones that have better properties that could make more of something than another? And the answer is, that's 
true for sure. We typically don't pick the organism. So we uh, really, we are a platform. So we try to be agnostic to the bug that you're using and the molecule you want to make, which is actually kind of cool and exciting um, because it means that applying engineering principles to genomes works regardless of where the genome came from. Um, so generally, we don't care, and so we don't control it. So we, that gets decided by what the customer is doing. So our customers tend to be people who are already using uh, these microbes in industrial fermentation um, settings, and so they come to us and they say, here's our current production microbe now, make this thing better. And so we often don't have a say. Um, we do have a cool contract with DARPA, though, where we are uh, experimenting more with kind of with that insulin example. So taking stuff from a ho taking genetic material from a host and putting it into uh, no, sorry, that's the host. Taking it from a donor and putting it into a host to basically introduce completely novel pathways into that organism that they wouldn't that don't exist in nature. And so the idea there is to make completely uh, potentially like non-biological materials with these things. And so that's a really cool area of work. But but all of this stuff is kind of the, cu the customer support and stuff. Yeah. Have you got a public data set, like a test data set, a training data set we could have a look at? Because I just think it'd be interesting to run <laughs> some different algorithms compared to what you've done. Yeah, I can ask about that. We definitely don't have anything public. Well, if you did some talk as an example, it'd be interesting just to see what the sort of results are um, just compared to the algorithms that you've used. Yeah. So did your customers come to you and ask for a specific effect size, or did you kind of like, you you, you, sh you showed your you showed your curve, do, do you just kind of like spitball it from the mix to cakes versus, you know, cakes to, you know, negative? Yeah, so I'm trying, to think, I'm trying to think about what I can say. So the question is, do your customers expect a, a certain effect size? So right, you're, 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 you're predicating your, your experimental design yeah. on, on he, it heavily depends on effect size. And, and you, are your customers coming in and just saying, make it better, yeah. we need more? Or are they, are, they, are they saying, we need this much more performance and then you design your experiment? Yeah, so it kind of, that depends like customer to customer. What Their target is, is something that they kind of specify and that's mm -hmm. like the nature sure. of the deal. But uh, in terms of actually getting there, is, is all kind of up to us. And so we can, we can estimate that stuff based on what we know about these projects and how they tend to work. But typically our customers don't, but they'll tell us how the strain is being used. And so we can get some sense for how much how much modification has already happened to this poor bug. Um, and so then we can kind of estimate like where on that, where on that cycle they are, because often they're already off of the second one, or off of the first one, um, depending on, on who it is. Sure. And so, yeah. We know that information, but it's kind of loose, so we have to make some guesses mm -hmm. about what to expect mm -hmm. and do some benchmarking before we start. Sure. Yeah. So you kind of run these experiments. I'm guessing you're trying to run a bunch of random mutations from the genome. So how do you achieve kind of inducing random mutations? Are they random? So we don't. <laughs> we do, do. So the question was how to induce random mutations. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we do. Uh, so random mutation is kind of the traditional model for, for doing this, and it's how like a lot of our customers do. Uh, typically, that's done with UV. So you put some bugs in a tray under some light, and turns out the sun is toxic. <laughs> Where's sunscreen, you guys? Toxic. <laughs> uh, and then we, we we screen that, and so that's actually where like the value of screening is really obvious because you have no control over what happens in that situation, and you also have no control. You have no idea what to guess in terms of the value of any of particular strain. Um, so that's one thing we do, but we also do like explicit engineering or what we call rational engineering. So we actually make guesses about what, where these levers and knobs are to pull to uh, to get the effect we want. So we do a lot, most of what we do is actually that, um, but we also do a parallel UV stuff because that's, that's the thing to do. And all of, are you collecting all like this historical data on all of your kind of previous experiments to maybe eventually go back and say, oh, here's the trend that we see, like here's particular mutations we've seen commonly happen that can yield better yields in the future? Yeah, yeah. So I didn't talk about this is all high throughput screening. This is kind of like our bread and butter, like how we serve uh, our customers. But a big question for us is uh, throughput is one thing, but if you like the average size of a genome for these guys is something on the order of. Uh, three to four thousand, uh, is that basis? 
Yeah. So you have a lot of obviously you have a lot of, you have a lot of choices to make, and so like even with really high throughput, you're not going to be able to like in, in protein studies, for example, you can do these saturation studies, so you can perturb every single residue in that entire protein. You can't do that with an entire genome, and so we actually need to be smarter about how we design experiments. And so yeah, we're doing a lot of work in that in predictive strain design. So are there uh, standard things that always work? Are there different mechanisms that always seem to work better? Um, and being able to ask those questions is really going to accelerate the throughput too, because we can just be smarter about the questions we ask of our screening apparatus. So if you're interested in that. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering, given all the experimental data that your company has, if, if you're able to, to sort of look at the results of the first screen, the second screen, and as you ramp up production, because it might be the case that mm -hmm. since you're trying thousands of uh, possible outcomes, you always get a hit of a really high magnitude. And that magnitude is always on the same scale. And then given that, your next stage always has a hit of a certain magnitude. So like, it's not the thing that's the same, but the hit of magnitude, the effect side, might always follow the same curve. Mm -hmm. It might enable you to sort of think about this as sort of an ideal detection and ideal production and ideal effect size along the production. So I was wondering if you've thought about that or done any of that or hmm. I'm not sure it. I completely follow. So I guess I guess if you're testing a thousand things mm -hmm. and some of those things will have large effect size, some won't. Yeah. Okay, and, and like you said, in the first initial testing is low sample size but large effect size. Mm -hmm. So if one of those effect sizes is fifty percent, is it always fifty percent no matter which gene you're splicing or which gene you're trying? You always get at least one hit that's a 50% gain. In which case, your sample sizes are always going to fall along that. Whatever sample yeah. size they need to get a 50% detection in their first test. Yeah, uh, I think I get what you're saying, but I don't think that property exists. Like I, I think that it's going to that uh, the regularity of the hit size is going to be really dependent on where we start on that productivity curve, but. I do think that if you know where you are on that, then you can make really good guesses about what you can expect to find, um, which I think is maybe what you're getting at. Okay, did I answer your question? Did that help? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, hold on. What is the output product? Is it a protein or is it like a modified uh, bacteria that you must attack? I think the first thing was about uh, quality measurements. Did you characterize the protein? Assuming that there's nothing in nature, uh, we're just assuming that and showing that you want. Are you asking what, are, what do we actually deliver? Yeah, what do you deliver? The first thing, what about uh, the kind of quality measurements? Yeah, so uh, typically, our, so what we deliver is a strain. So they come in with a strain, and then we do all of our thing, and then we hand them back a strain that works better than the one that they gave us. Um, and the quality stuff, the, in terms of quality, the way that we, we validate the performance of that strain is through the, the fermentation tanks. So all this screening is really just in service of getting us to uh, tank performance. And so we, we run experiments in the tank where we really carefully monitor the environment. We, we sample that environment and then also do all kinds of uh, diagnostics about you know, the energy that went in, how much was used, and then how much, like, the different, kind of the difference between yield and productivity. So how much did you actually make, and how much did you make per unit of energy? Um, and so those are the things that we're interested in looking at. And, yeah, on the plan. Yeah? Uh, kind of along the same lines as his question, uh, when you, after you run your first experiment for a new strain from a customer, does that help inform you to understand where along the S-curve you are? Hmm. Like, like you said, like 50% could be like, you think you're very early on the curve, then you're probably around the 10% range, maybe you're kind of in the middle. Yeah, that definitely is helpful. So the question is, uh, after you run the initial screen, does that give you some indication of where you are in that productivity cycle? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and so definitely. So uh, in general, as soon as like that, that curve is actually not very representative, I think, of, of the actual time we spend in any of those, because that initial little phase at the beginning where everything is cool and we're getting these really big effect sizes is actually quite short-lived. So that might be only a couple screening cycles and then immediately we're, we're jumping into this area where we're not going to be able to get really quick hits uh, like we did in the, the early stages. So yeah, that's definitely pretty apparent from 
uh, kind of the, so the, for that you can look at sort of the distribution of hits. So is it the case now that I used to get like 20% of my samples were these hits, and now I'm down to 5%? Well, that's an indication that it's time to rethink your study design, right? That you probably don't have enough resolution to detect the size of changes that you're looking for. Yeah. So it sounded like you were um, using simulations to sort of do like a risk analysis. And in the example you said, you were like we're looking at a specific sort of distribution that you're modeling. And I'm wondering, basically all these perturbations are going to have like different types of distributions, right? And so I'm wondering if you guys would look at now a distribution of di distributions would affect these types of numbers and yeah. basically how well uh, your like, previous assumptions about this distribution, this distribution matches like a uh, future hypothesis test. Yeah, I think that's kind of getting back to the, the question from the front before, which is about, you know, we simulated all this this data that we're using to test and to compute all of this stuff, but we simulated it based on distributions that we know our measurements don't follow, really just for simplicity in this case. And so, uh, yeah, I would expect that these results are going to be really, really sensitive to the way that we actually describe what our data looks like. And in this case, we described it in a way that we know isn't realistic. Um, did, did that, I don't know. I just wanted, yeah, like if you guys have seen like any same patterns or has from like how different distributions of these distributions might like, impact these numbers, like uh, it doesn't really matter that much, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, uh, we have, I haven't looked that deeply at the distributions on distributions on distributions, but yeah, I like, I would expect all of this stuff, and that's a, that would be a really cool thing to explore, like, all of this stuff is going to be really sensitive to the way that you generate the data that you're that you're testing and analyzing, um, and so I wouldn't be surprised to see if we made different assumptions about the distributions of those observations, if those uh, test comparisons just completely flip flop, or if they're just completely completely different than what we found in this particular case. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Uh, do you all ever like uh, calibrate your equipment and like run an experiment where? Like you know, you should detect you know something to happen. Like right? you're determining if your equipment's right or if you're simulating Do we calibrate the equipment? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, we do. Um, yeah. So that that's actually that touches on a huge part of this work that I didn't talk about at all. Um, and and that's really about normalization. So part of the variance that I was describing comes from instruments, but it also is just like runtime variability. And so I might run the same sample this week and the next week and get completely different results, or at least the central tendency might be different for those two different plates. And so prior to actually doing all of this analysis, there's actually a, a big uh, normalization step that has to occur. And that's largely to correct for like locational biases. So these things are screened on these like fairly dense plates of wells, and they've got their little guys in there. And it turns out that this is a pretty common phenomenon that anything that is uh, on a plate like that will have kind of different evaporation gradients. So if you happen to be on the border, if you're on a well that's on the border of this plate, you're going to you're going to evaporate faster and we're looking at concentrations, right? So you lose fluid, you have the same amount of stuff in it. So now suddenly everything on the border is a hit because the concentration of stuff just got really high. So there's actually a ton of work that goes into normalizing and making sure that we've accounted for like kind of process related bias that's coming from these machines or just the way that we assay our measurements that we have completely ignored here. And that's actually the thing I'm most excited about expanding this into because if we can articulate what those biases are that are related, for example, to location on the plate, then we can actually start to benchmark um, how well various uh, tests work and how well various normalization techniques work. So how well are we able to actually eliminate biases if we've explicitly modeled them, which we haven't uh, yet, but yeah, that's a really annoying problem. Question about uh, like cross pollination of different molecules you're working with. So you have n customers, and they have n different uh, molecules that they're fermenting at the end of the day from their strains. Mm -hmm. Do you take the the knowledge that you've gained from sort of maximizing the efficiency of one of their bugs for doing one fermentation? Say, oh, this molecule is kind of like similar in this pathway to this other bug that we're working with, like let's apply the same principles to this other thing, like sort of like sassiness. If yeah. You know. uh, so the question is, do we use something we've learned 
in one place to you and apply that in other places. Is that yeah, fair? I guess yeah, I or maybe a, like on the biological level, I guess. Yeah, so sort of. So like we, we do that at the sen in the sense where we understand that certain mechanisms of intervention on the genome are more effective than others. Uh, but it's a big difficult area to work in if you think about like how many people are doing industrial fermentation. Like we're potentially working with com competing interests and so we can't actually use a lot of information between projects because we can't use something we've learned on the same bug for one guy and then use it for the same bug for that guy's competitor. But we do understand more about the mechanisms of what we're doing and when we're doing that rational engineering and what we're actually modifying. And that stuff we can read. So if we know that a certain type of technique of modification works better, or if this class of genes controls this type of thing, uh, and that works better, then we can we can definitely reuse that information. So yeah, we definitely learn from stuff that way. Yeah. So the genes you're modifying, are they typically uh, genes that code for enzymes, and then if so, like how do you decide which, you know, what part of the enzyme to, to modify? Um. Let's see. If you can say. Yeah, I'm trying to think if I can say. Um, so the way that we do it, basically, uh, without saying, without really answering your question, is that we have a group of people that we call developmental biologists or development biologists. Sorry, developmental biologists, different thing. Uh, and they they're the people who basically design our strains. So they they look at metabolic networks and they think about what they're trying to make and they they try to reason about that network and, and what we could perturb to get more out of the the thing that we're actually trying to make. And so there's some intuition and, you know, kind of reasoning about what what we can expect. Um, but again, a big area of work um, for myself and uh, our, our big future team is this area of prediction. So can we, uh, can we augment the domain expertise of these development biologists who don't scale very well uh, and give them more tools to help pick targets for engineering? But yeah, it varies a lot from yeah. So a little bit more of a big picture question. Uh, guys like Peter Thiel have commented how uh, software technology, cloud technology, and biotech are completely different because the R&D costs are almost orders of magnitude different. Um, you know, it takes a billion dollars to develop a drug yep. versus a new software project you can launch for $10,000. Um, do you see kind of a fundamental collaboration issue like open source, which is what you're talking about, where it's all compartmentalized, you can't share the IP? Is that going to be a big problem for that industry, or do you see any kind of collaboration trends that are going to kind of uh, bring that industry forward towards what's standard in, in software? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question, I think, is uh, is kind of the privacy of biotech as, in contrast with the open source community a detriment to progress in that area? So are we going to need to be more open about what we're doing in order to make progress the same way that technology has. Is that fair? Yep. Um, and I don't know. So maybe, maybe, um, but like I think about like your collaboration with Swiss, right? Like making, uh, like there, there are a lot of shops now that do nothing but make like custom DNA for these applications. So there's already like kind of an economy, I guess, of exchange. It's not open, I guess, but there are vendors. There are like technology vendors, I guess, that now support synthetic biology or uh, biotech in general. Um, and so I see that as being healthy. Honestly, I think sort of the volatility that we've seen in performance of biotechnology companies has been uh, partially the result of a focus on really, really hard problems. So there are a lot. There were a lot of companies doing uh, stuff with microbes and in particular with yeast to try to make energy, to make clean energy or to make new drugs, or to do all kinds of things that are, of course, things that we want to do, but are really, really hard problems. And so we're trying. We're not trying to tackle all of the hardest problems. We're actually pretty thoughtful about focusing on people who are already using these things in production, and so we can just improve existing infrastructure. Uh, and then we'll hopefully tackle hard problems. So not that these aren't hard problems, but like the, those huge really ambitious problems. So I think a lot of that volatility is actually that we were asking kind of too much of what, what this could deliver uh, at the time. Um, yeah, so I don't know, like, yeah, it's definitely an issue, like the the secrecy of everything, but I don't know. Uh, the thing that's different, I think there's a bit of a, there's a problem here, is that the problem in the medical space 
is not necessarily coming off the front. It is the cost of the testing mm -hmm. against very broad distributions of consumption. So if I develop a drug, the main problem is not that it cures someone, it's that it will be a subset of things that we have to really adverse effects that drug. That means that I spend billions of dollars determining who those people are. So the question then is, is that one of the evolutions of medicine is really the mechanism to test. Because if I can test and I can predict that you'll have an adverse effect, then it reduces my cost drastically. But the medical infrastructure of current testing and validation, those laws and structures have not changed to accommodate that. So for example, I don't test drugs in the US because practically everyone in this room is taking a drug, which means this is a fact. Most Americans take drugs, so you can't do tests for drugs in the US. You actually go to Africa and do it there. And they have a much higher diversity of genetics in Africa, which means of course there's a whole bunch of problems when we do the tests there. So the point being is, is Fields, I don't necessarily agree with Fields. So, so, the, so the issue is, well, I mean, part of it is sort of a, a non-ideal population, but another way is just the, the legal environment, right? You have to go somewhere where there's a legal environment, different environment that's conducive to proper experimentation and sharing. No, people share. It's just that the problem is, is that there's, there's so much money involved. Yeah. You know, if you make, if you tell someone something, the guys who create the 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 uh, heart stent, they almost went bankrupt before they actually got into market. In fact, I think they did. Go look at the Xerox photocopier. The guy who invented that grew up in a chicken coop. Cool. Great question. <laughs> <laughs> Time for about two, two more questions. And then uh, uh, I'm going to invite up uh, Redfin up here. Um, but uh, yeah, two more questions. We'll go from there. <laughs> so I, I think it's interesting, you know, there's basically no reason to use the tea test, which was developed for microbial, you know, making beer, right? So, <laughs> which is a microbe. Yeah. But, but that's, I guess we, you don't need to use the tea test because computing is cheap now, right? So you can do these simulations. Oh, yeah. Or, I mean, you can use the tea test, like, if, so if we were running, you know, 10 experiments and we were making 20 replicates, that's probably still the thing I would do first. but. Just in the, in the particular situation we find ourselves in, with the really low resolution and uh, high degree of extreme values, yeah, it's just it's not the best. Uh, so when you're showing us the distribution, like the different distribution, like three to ten replicates, mm -hmm. uh, and you're trying to choose which one would be best, do you do a sort of like cost benefit analysis to say like here's the difference, like the cost, additional cost of doing one additional replicate is X, yeah. and then I get this kind of this X amount of benefit. You kind of do a that's yeah. Formula for that, or you Boy, that would have been compelling, right? So yeah, like so the reason again that I didn't do a great job of making this point, but the reason that this is besides the fact that like if we get this wrong, we mess up a lot of stuff. Well, I mean it's still really the same reason. The reason that this is important to us is because we do really capital intensive uh, experimentation, and so there's real trade-offs between running more replicates, running you know double the amounts or whatever, even a couple more. That can be that can directly be tied to money. So like, we can actually quantify exactly how much it would cost to run more replicates. Um, and that's not something we included in this, but that would actually be really cool. Like to include in the simulations, kind of you're optimizing really two things. You're looking, you want obviously the best resolution and power, and then you also want the lowest cost. And so that would be actually really really cool to include. And that's something that could actually we could actually really pretty easily do. Yeah. So we should. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again, Aaron. Yeah, thank you.